Hello, uh, this is Terry Denry of The MathWorks. Um, we're going to kick off a little video series on mechatronic systems. And our focal point, uh, at least for these initial videos, will be this robotic arm. right? And the robotic arm's got, I think, six degrees of freedom. Uh, it's got some gears right there. You'll see it's got uh, a little spring right here. But for the most part, the development, at least of software, to make the system move the way we want it to is about these black DC motors right here. Okay, And um, I hope that this is a, a very relevant uh, series for, for many more people than just those who are developing a robotic arm like this. That, that this is about the combination of mechanics, electronics, and software to make these systems move in a way that we want them to move and to find some utility in doing that. So anyways, I hope you like the series and uh, Let's get started. Okay, so this first video is going to address the topic of accuracy, speed, and power consumption trade-offs that take place in the development of a robotic arm. And we're going to do this by employing some simulation. All right, and we'll have a plant model, you know, which will be a direct model of the mechanics and the electronics of this robotic assembly. All right, and the you know basic point here is that none of this works unless these plant models are good enough, and so we'll have a few videos that will address this topic. Then we'll move into controls. All right now, with a, a good plant model, basically we can very thoroughly explore the performance possibilities for this robotic arm and come up with a design for the software that will achieve what we need it to achieve. So let's begin with a simulation of our robot. We're going to see it moving through a pretty simple trajectory. What we're actually looking at are two robots. The blue one is a perfect implementation of our trajectory. The multicolored one is a plant model of our design, where we're essentially modeling directly the mechanics, the electronics, and the control. We'll see that our design, for the most part, is doing quite well, as it follows almost perfectly the blue robot. At the end, however, there is a problem. So we're running this simulation with MATLAB and Simulink. Right? And we're looking at the Simulink model here, which basically has three main components. You know, there's the plant model. It's the mechanics and the electronics of that robotic assembly. Okay, there's the controller. And then there's the path plan for the robot. Um, the controller ultimately is software that's running on an embedded processor that's directly connected to that robot. It can issue torques that will be implemented by those electric motors and that this algorithm running on here will be informed by measurements coming from the robot, namely you know, the angles of each of these motors. Now the path plan is actually really interesting software. Uh, employs inverse kinematics to identify the perfect angles for each of these motors to achieve our overall motion objective. Now we saw a problem and the problem in my opinion is that we're probably underpowered and so I'm going to go into my robotic assembly and essentially adjust my voltage. And So let's put in 30 volts and let's hit the run button. The premise of this solution is that the robot was underpowered at 10 volts. So at 30 volts, it looks like we're doing pretty well. All right. But the real problem came when it attempted to return to a vertical position. So that's at about 33 seconds. So let's fast forward to that point All right, and see how it does. And it seems that, indeed, it was underpowered and that this does seem like a fix that could work. So there are things you can do in simulation that you really just can't do with real, real hardware. And so I'm probably overpowering uh, the motors beyond what they've been rated for by applying 30 volts. So let's go back to 10 volts and let's find a simpler solution. So let's go to the trajectory plan and let's just slow things down. So it's doing very well. All right. So let's pause it. Let's bring it to that difficult maneuver where it returns to a vertical position. 
and we will see that we're back on track. So we're powering it with 10 volts, but because we're moving at half the speed, uh, we're able, the 10 volts is enough to achieve our motion objective. Okay, so I'd like to um, assess this performance uh, a little bit more quantitatively. And so in doing that, I want to look at speed and accuracy and power consumption. All right, and with regard to speed and accuracy, I think it's useful to look at this axis right here. All right, so if you see uh, kind of this part where it comes up, this is the axis that's really doing most of the work. I'm bringing it back to the vertical position. So we call that the forearm, and uh, let's look at the data. So let's begin at the run uh, where we powered it with 30 volts, where things looked really, really good. Right, so I want to look at the forearm command angle, and we're going to see it operated at a range from about zero to a little bit more than 120 degrees. All right, and so that's the command, and here's the delivered. All right, so those two curves look like they're you know identical. All right, and so just to get a little bit better quantitation on this, let's look at the difference between the two, and this is what I call angle error. All right, and you're going to see that we're operating for 30 volts at an error you know, a difference between command and delivered of less than, well, about one hundredth of a degree, which is really quite small. Now in that last run, we did quite well too. You know, and let's look at this for the full 80 seconds. And we'll see we, we even did better. We're probably at somewhere around three one thousandths of a degree. You know, and to just give you a little bit of context of how small that number is, let's compare it to the first run. All right, so those are essentially negligible compared to the 50 degree departures that we have at the end of that run. It's interesting to look at the electric power consumption. Okay, so this is the electric power consumed by the entire robot, all five actuators, all right, for the entire mission, all right, and there is a difference between mechanical power, you know, namely that electric power is the one that you pay for. All right. And so for the most part, engineering teams have much more keen interest in electric power consumption than mechanical power. But, of course, there is a relationship between the two. And certainly when we go back to that vertical position, we're seeing that in our power trace that that's the largest consumption period of electric power. All right. So what I'd like to do now is compare it to our first simulation where we ran the robot with 10 volts. So this one right now we're looking at is the one that we ran with 30 volts. Okay, And um, obviously we recall it going kind of haywire at the end and we see you know as it attempted to move back to the vertical position it could not deliver on the power requirement you know when it was operating at 10 volts. Um, I think it's quite interesting that for the most part you know it performs quite well at 10 volts. Uh, I'd also like to just kind of focus on the beginning right here, right? That there's a little bit of a departure between what we want the robot to do and what it does do. And uh, I think we can see that if we go back to the animation. I'll just hit run and we'll kind of see it. Right there, we're seeing just a slight departure, maybe four or five degrees at the most, okay? But we see that that, again, is a inability to deliver on the power. Right. And so this is kind of the final point on this, all right, is that we can develop controls that, you know, will move this robot through its trajectory plan, you know, very precisely, you know, at 10 volts where it can, you know, move at 10 volts, right? But when it, it sees, you know, one of these more diff difficult maneuvers, you know, that we can adjust the tra trajectory plan too and maybe simply slow it down. You know, these are things that we can do through controls. All right, and so now just to kind of make my, my final point, you know, is that a hundredth of a degree might be pretty difficult, right? And that you really don't know what you're getting into until you actually get into it at times, all right? And, um, and, and what I do know is that I meet with an awful lot of engineering teams, and I know that it can be done. Right, and that among these engineering teams often are very good mechanical engineers, you know, who come up with designs with very good balance and you know proper choices for bearings and things like that. Uh, that they include electrical engineers who choose appropriately the electric motors. Um, that includes software and control and testing people, you know, who know how to 
implement a sensor to kind of achieve the precision on the measurement that we're going to need for this. All right. And, and so, you know, with this idea in mind of kind of facilitating the collaboration of these development teams, our next few videos are going to really kind of focus on the various workflows that, that will participate to achieve kind of the, the greatest success in developing these electromechanical systems. So anyways, we think we got something that's pretty good and uh, we absolutely hope that you, uh, you believe this too and that you continue to kind of join us as we go through this. Thank you for watching our video. Um, if you liked it, please give us a thumbs up. That's very helpful and we appreciate it very much. Um, also, please join me on Twitter. I'd love to hear what you think and it'd be great to kick off a good conversation. So anyways, this is Terry. Thank you.